Hello. This lecture is on early European Native American contact. In 21st century American history textbooks, historians refer to the indigenous peoples of what is today the United States as Native Americans or Indians. These people were the first immigrants to the New World, wandering across Asia and then migrating across a land bridge linking Siberia and Alaska. This took place thousands of years ago. Before the arrival of Europeans to North America, much later, the estimated number of indigenous people in today's United States was 10 million. There was a diversity of traditions and languages among Native Americans, but their way of life can be divided in the following categories. Northwest Coast, Plateau, Great Basin, Southwest, Plains, and Eastern Woodlands, both in the Northeast and Southeast. The Northwest Coast people were near the bounty of the sea and they had greater resources than most inland peoples. Because of the abundance of fish and sea mammals, the people did not travel far for food. All year long, they lived in villages of cedar, timber, and plank construction. The people of the Plateau region had extensive rivers and alpine landscapes. They relied on salmon, game, and harvest, plant harvest. Those located in California experienced a mild climate and abundance of food. Such conditions supported large and stable populations, and there were more than 100 languages spoken in California. The people who inhabited the Great Basin, which would be today's Nevada, were isolated and survived in a vast, arid, and hostile environment. Not having settled communities, they traveled in small, mobile bands. Peoples of the Southwest, and this would be today's Arizona and New Mexico, they also lived in an air region a harshly unforgiving land where irrigation systems were necessary. In most of the region, there were less than 10 inches of rainfall each year. As for game, there were deer, bear, elk, and wild turkey in the high country, and wild pig, rabbit, and antelope in the desert scrub. Most people lived in communities composed of stone and adobe structures. The Plains people lived in the open grasslands that encompass a large area that extended from Texas up to today's Canadian prairie provinces. The buffalo was the staple of existence for these people. There was no waste. The buffalo supplied food and material for teepees, clothes, shields, eating and drinking instruments, bowstring, and fuel. Why did they burn dung, buffalo dung for heat? Well, there were no trees. Because the buffalo were large animals that could run 50 kilometers per hour, the natives devised and effective method of ambush ambushing the herds and in some cases forcing them over a cliff. Before the arrival of the horse in the 1700s, the Plains Native Americans used dogs to transport their camps and supplies. The Eastern woodland peoples were migratory. They were hunters and fishers and in, in essence, uh, semi-nomadic. Algonquin groups in the Northeast farmed, hunted, and fished. The Iroquois depended much more on farming for survival, 
particular corn and beans. Their vi villages were stockaded and could house as many as 1,500 people. In the south, there were major centers. One trading center near St. Louis had a population as high as 40,000. The Woodland Indians had access to more food than any other region in North America. Scholars point to the importance of religious beliefs for helping Indians make sense of their world. Native Americans believed in an unseen world. Spiritual advisors or shamans were particularly skilled in accessing the powers of the unseen world. Each member of the community however, had the potential to acquire spiritual power. Indians had a contractual or symbolic relationship with the forces of nature. Between the natives and animals, there was a relationship of mutual courtesy. For example, a hunter would have to demonstrate respect for his prey or else the animal spirit would retaliate and cause his arrows to miss future prey. And also cause animals could possibly flee the hunting areas if there had been cases of disrespect. Animals also took offense when they were slaughtered in excessive numbers. Scholars argue that Indians embrace concepts of communal property, hunting areas, and kinship responsibilities. There was the expectation of people sustaining the community as a whole by sharing and having respect for each other. The social system of most communities reflected a primitive com communal society. Typically, women did much of the labor-intensive jobs. The primary role of males was hunting. With the lack of incentives for males to be productive individually, the communal social arrangement remained pretty static over many centuries. Native Americans lacked a police force or judiciary to enforce justice. When there were murders, the relatives of the victim were expected to avenge the murder by killing the suspected killer or someone related to the killer but families of the killer were honor bound to protect the killer. The result of this dilemma could be prolonged blood feuds or intertribal warfare. Avenging murders were usually the reason for such wars. Emotions could run high in the Northwest, sorry, in the Northeast, for example, an Iroquois captive was forced back to the enemy villages, village where they were beaten, sometimes bitten, and forced to run naked through a gauntlet of angry villagers. If one was brave, they might be adopted into the village. Those who did not measure up were further tortured. Hair was ripped out, fingernails pulled off, flesh burned, and bones could be broken. Sometimes the villagers ate bits of a victim's flesh in a sacrificial rite designed to gain the victim's wisdom and strength. Scholars believe that warfare was a major source of male prestige. The late 15th and 16th century marked the period of increased discovery and exploration. 
It is said that economic motives and the desire to spread Christianity motivated Europeans to explore other lands. The Portuguese, the Spanish, the English, and others wanted to find a new route to Asia and its treasures of spices and other useful commodities. Christopher Columbus made contact with the Caribbean in 1492. Believing that people he encountered were of the Indies, that is people of India slash Asia, he named them Indians. The name America given to the land originated from Amerigo Vespucci, an Italian merchant who later visited and wrote about the new lands. In 1497, Genesis John Cabot under the English set out on the Matthew to find Japan. Well, Cabot instead found Newfoundland. Claiming the new land for England, Cabot and his men sailed homeward, convinced they had reached the shores of Asia. Back in England, Cabot spoke of the rich abundance of cod on the Great Banks located off of Newfoundland. With the fishery of the Great Banks, a matter of public knowledge, the North American fishing industry began. Due to, the, due to distractions in Europe and lack of success in finding the riches and the Northwest Passage to the Indies, European interest in North America was sporadic. The Spanish, however, did establish the first permanent European settlement in the present day United States, the small military post of St. Augustine in the year 1565. Eventually, the English showed interest in colonization. One incentive was the push-pull issue of land. Land was becoming scarce in 16th century England and the new world appeared to promise much. At the time, the economic system of mercantilism was adopted. It was believed the world's wealth was finite. Thus, the key goal of a country was to export more and import less from other countries. According to the mercantile theory, colonies strengthened the mother country by providing a market for the mother country's manufactured goods and a source of supply for raw materials that the mother country required. The goal was for a nation to outperform other nations by selling a greater number of goods. Thus, if we look at the wealth of the world in the sense of it being a pie, the objective of any of the leading nations was to have a bigger supply, a bigger slice of that finite wealth. Christianity was another motivation for colonization. As a result of the Protestant Reformation initiated by Martin Luther in 1517, the unity of Christendom was shattered. Those who protested against the Catholic Church eventually were called Protestants. In England, the Protestant Reformation occurred politically as a result of Henry VIII's anger with the Pope 
for not being for not granting a divorce for from his Spanish wife. King Henry wanted to to have a divorce. After breaking England, England's ties with the Catholic Church, King Henry VIII established the Church of England, and he placed himself at the head. For over a hundred years, the English political life was often rocked with religious dissension, Protestants versus Catholics, and the Protestant Church of England versus dissenting Protestants who believed that the Anglicans, that is the Church of England, fell short all the necessary reforms. Those who wanted to purify the Church of England became known as Puritans. As we will see in, uh, in another lecture, these nonconformists looked to America as a safe haven to practice their faith. The pioneers of English colonization were Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Sir Walter Raleigh. In 1578, Gilbert obtained from Queen Elizabeth the exclusive right to inhabit and possess land in the New World. He claimed Newfoundland for England, as had Cabot done so earlier, but he was lost to sea. His half-brother, Raleigh, secured a similar grant from the Queen and landed on an island off the coast of North Carolina. He named the area Virginia in honor of Elizabeth the Virgin Queen. At Roanoke, a colonization attempt ended in tragedy when the colonists perished without a trace. These uh, people had been dropped off to establish this settlement and they were left to their own devices. And when ships finally returned, uh, a few years later, there was no trace of the colonists. Consequently, when Elizabeth when Queen Elizabeth died in the year 1603, there was not one English person living in North America. Despite the Raleigh failure, other attempts of colonization began in the early 1600s, a century when all but one of the 13 North American colonies began. When we look at the original 13 colonies, only Georgia was, began in the 18th century, that is in the early 1700s. Well, the process started in 1606 when King James I issued a new charter to the Virginia Company, which divided America between two companies, two groups. There was the London Company and the Plymouth Company. The London Company received the right to colonize from North Carolina to present day New York City, whereas the Plymouth Company received the right to colonize from New York to today's Maine. Thus, rather than the English crown, English joint stock companies initiated much of the early colonization. Joint stock companies, and this allowed limited liability, met the requirements of the new trading companies operating in new lands in which the financial and political risks were greater. That's with when you have a joint stock company, you have many people involved and thus there's the, the limit 
the liability is spread over a large number of people. And you, in this case, you can have the, the, this larger group generate the necessary resources to meet your objectives. But if, if there's failure, it would be the case where not any one or several or, or a smaller number of people would be at uh, risk of losing everything. Well, besides, uh, we we see that the private ventures in America appeal to King James. A thriving trade trade meant that more taxes and custom duties would fill royal uh, coffers, increasing royal power. That logic led James to lend his approval to the private venture that brought the first white settlers to the Chesapeake area region. So in 1607, the first permanent English colony was planted in Virginia at Chesapeake Bay by the London Company. Unfortunately, the approximate 100 men who landed, and they had arrived on uh, three ships in April of 1607, unfortunately, they were unprepared to sustain themselves. Rather than growing food, the men searched for gold. They piled up lumber, tar, pitch, and iron ore for export. The Jamestown colony barely survived, only saved from extinction by the leadership of Captain John Smith. Smith did provide get tough policies to improve their chances of survival, but the early life of Jamestown remained tenuous with episodes of famine and disease. The English, in some cases, uh, ate horses, dogs, cats, rats, snakes, roots, and even old shoe leather. And this is, again, an example of the famine, starvation that hit. One crazed man, quote, murdered his wife, ripped the child out of her womb and threw it into the river and chopped the mother in pieces and salted her for his food, end of quote. Well, this man was executed. In 1609, other settlers arrived, including some women and children, but they had experienced a long and storing voyage, and the following winter was brutal. A turning point in the colony's history was uh, in, 19, in 1612 when John Wolfe discovered that tobacco grew well in Virginia soil. Soon, tobacco cultivation spread up and down the James River. Again, there was uh, in increasing uh, attraction and interest in this uh, tobacco. The English Native American contact that took place in the early 17th century is a story of mostly distrust, desperation and deadly struggle. The English of Jamestown unwittingly arrived in the midst of land claimed by a powerful native emperor named Poetan. Upon the arrival of the English, Poetan was a tall, well-proportioned, active man in his 60s. Apparently, he had 100 wives. His 14,000 subjects and 3,200 warriors saw him as a king of almost God status. The not easily impressed Captain John Smith acknowledged that the a uh, dignified demeanor of Poetan. 
His chiefs paid tribute to him with furs, copper, pearls, game, and corn, and all valuables that were held in a treasure house that was half the length of a football field. Poetin was the law. Justice to serious offenders included thrown into pits of hot coals, quote, brained on altar stones, or butchered with razor sharp shells and reeds, end of quote. Because Eastern woodland tribes autonomously uh, lived autonomously in villages of a few hundred people led by an elected or hereditary chief, the Poetan Empire was unique for its large size and the power and, and how, you know, Poetan, this, this native emperor, how much power he had. As I alluded to earlier, many of those who, the Europeans who arrived were virtually clueless on what to do to assure survival in the new land. Too many were tender-fingered gentlemen. To make matters worse, the choice of Jamestown Island for the site of a triangular fort was unwise. The site, the site located up the James River, where fresh water and salt water ties mats. It, at this site, you, in essence, what you have is um, a tangle of bogs and marshes. And the, consequently, the island lacks safe drinking water. Dysentery, typhoid, salt poisoning, in addition to malnutrition, resulted in many deaths. Poor relations with the Poetans made matters worse. The first meeting between the English scouting group and Poetan was peaceful. Poetin formed a military pact with the English, probably worried that the English might develop friendly relations with his enemies. For the first two years, economic necessity, social compromise, and political accommodation were the only issues that kept the English and the Poetins from battling each other. On the one hand, Poetin did not want the English to gain much land and power. On the other hand, he did not want to jeopardize trade relations. He also favored their armed services in case he was challenged by his traditional enemies. Thus, Poetin adopted a policy that historians have said um, signify or suggest was one that wavered between killing and kindness. In other words, quote, enough Englishmen would have to be kept alive to ensure the continual arrival of the company ships, but not enough to overrun his land and seduce his subjects, end of quote. The English themselves were guided by necessity the company's order was to maintain peaceful relations with the natives, and the English could not initially survive without the assistance of the natives. As more English arrived in Jamestown, hostilities increased. Po po Poetin war parties were dispatched to kill the English, and skirmishes continued until 1614 when Pocahontas, daughter of Poetin, helped secure an uneasy ceasefire. Years earlier, she had relations with John Smith, but Pocahontas married John Rolfe and received baptism into the Church of England. Sadly, she died prematurely in England in 1617, one year before Poetin's death. But after, well, after the passing of Poetin, relations between the natives and the English worsened. 
A characteristic of tobacco was that it was a soil depleting crop and the English discovered that the tidewater land only lasted for three years before nutrients became depleted. The English required new land, land that was occupied by the Pohesians. In early 1622, the Poetians struck with a surprise attack and they killed approximately 350 men, women, children of the 1,240 colonists in the James River region. As reported by a company spokesman by the name of Edward Waterhouse, the reason for this surprise attack, this uprising was, quote, the daily fear that possesses them that in time we by our growing continue upon them would dispossess them of this country, end quote. The response by the edgy English was slow, survivors, still were vulnerable to other attack. In time, the English leaders decided that total unrelating, unrelenting war was the only permanent solution. At a so-called peace meeting the following year, and that, that would be 1623, 200 natives were killed. The next year, in 1624, King James dissolved the Virginia Company. Virginia became a royal colony. Now, as the colony grew, the Poetans were unable to resist the English. The last major assault by the Poetans took place in the year 1644, when almost 400 colonists were killed. In conclusion, the early contact between Europeans and South and, and Native Americans is a story of strained relations. Seeking to protect their land, Native leaders were wary of the Europeans who showed more, who showed more interest in land than trade. In fact, the English wanted to expand their agriculture operations. And in addition, they wanted to introduce Christianity to the natives. Neither side could advance their cause without adversely affecting the other. Of course, the conflict was no different than much of human conflict stretching back many centuries. Thank you.